Hey guys, Armor Gun here today with what I would consider to be the first bolt gun that really got me excited. The fix by these guys just hits different. Now as a bit of an intro to this video, I was planning on just doing a product overview, just covering the features and specs to round out my video series on this firearm. That being the first person shooting video where we covered the shooting characteristics and impressions as well as the running the controls. All right. And then the full and complete breakdown retook this thing from as you see it to pretty much a bare receiver. However, the Fix has always been a pretty important rifle to me. I've followed it for a very long time. I've just been fascinated with it for, for several years now. I've watched just about every piece of content, read all the articles. And then when I finally got my hands on this one a couple months ago, I pretty much rewatched them all again. Just, to, uh, you, you can't fully appreciate the Fix until you get your hands on it. And I will say that, because as much, as much as I tried to absorb about this gun ahead of time, it's getting in your hands, running the action, feeling how, it blew me away. It took me a few days to get over how light the damn thing was. But at any rate, I played with it lots. I've run a couple hundred rounds through it now as well in various states from out of the box factory to having installed Q's aftermarket parts like the big butt pad, the big bolt knob, and the bottle rocket muzzle brake, as well as the short little rail up there. And as you see it, it's pretty much my ideal gun. I'm pretty much married to the Elkan optics across the board but I would consider swapping it out here. I'd run this firearm based on what I was using it for. And right now, that's just hitting steel within 300 yards. So the one by four Spectre is just fine. I'm not doing any serious range work. If I did, I'd slap on something else. All in all, with the amount of research and the personal experience I've had with this rifle now, I feel fully comfortable in giving it a formal review. So I'll go ahead and give you guys all the features and specs, as well as my personal comments on the rifle as we go. Now for a quick disclaimer on biases, yes, I am biased pretty heavily towards this firearm. So keep that in mind. Self-admittedly, I'm a bit of a Q fanboy as well, kind of across the board. I think they're a pretty cool company and they do a lot of really cool stuff. Their marketing game is definitely on point and I admire the fact that they really try and push the envelope with the products they produce. So keep that in mind as you watch this video, though I do intend on being fully transparent and calling this rifle out where it needs to be called out and singing its praises where it deserves them. Now, finally, Q did send me this rifle, though they did not reach out to me. I reached out to them and I pestered them for about a year before that happened. This rifle was received with no strings attached. There are no preconceived notions. There was nothing else that happened. It was simply gear being sent to me for some honest feedback. And uh, to be honest, some pretty dead sexy photos. Guys, from a really high level, I love and strongly recommend this firearm. So if that's all you wanted to hear, you can sign off now. Otherwise, we're gonna dive into this thing, go through all the features and specs, and three big things that are commonly discussed as negatives about this rifle. That being the price, the perceived heavy bolt lift coming from the 45 degree short throw bolt, and the spicy recoil off of the 16 inch 308 rifle that weighs six pounds, two ounces. The itinerary for the rest of the video is I'm gonna grab the rifle off the wall. We're gonna go through all these special aspects of the fix pretty hands-on, and then we'll cover those three big things. And then finally, I'll give you my thoughts on kind of the philosophy of use behind a rifle like this and where I think it really excels and where I think it probably isn't the rifle for you, at least not in this current setup. Now, a huge part of what makes the Fix by Q super special is the fact that it does away with the traditional action inside of a stock or chassis and instead uses this unibody or one piece receiver. Now it's a billet 6061, but it is already plenty strong and that's about as light as it can be. It's very narrow and very tall, and again, that contributes naturally to that structural integrity. And it also allows them to control a lot of tolerances really well. With the built-in magwell, again, they can control that feeding height, and they marry in all of these controls right off of an AR-15. Ambidextrous safety. This one's a Talon safety by rating. It's custom made to fit this gun. They have an AR-15-like magazine release. This one's oversized, but on the other side, you can see that's uh, very indicative of an AR-15 mag catch. And that's because on the full size fix, this uses SR25 pattern magazines. So P mags will fit in there. So will these SR25s, Lancers, you name it. And then on the mini fix, it uses standard AR15 magazines. Now the receiver itself is incredibly simple. There's only like four moving parts in it. And that's your safety, your mag catch, your bolt release up in here and your trigger. So really quickly, we are clear. And the trigger pull on this thing is absolutely gorgeous. Your take up is about six ounces and is adjustable. You can dial a lot of this out. You hit a very firm wall, boom, crisp break. It's about a 2.5 pound trigger and it's just beautiful. Big part of how they get such a great trigger on this gun is the fact that the striker assembly is all up in here. This literally, all this does 
when you're pulling the trigger is it has a little bar that comes up and touches the sear. That drops the internal striker assembly in here and allows it just to be super, super clean. Another really cool thing about the trigger itself is it's got a rotation on there so that it's perfectly balanced. That's for drop safety. If you drop the gun, it never wants to impart force for the trigger to kind of naturally pull itself. If I forgot to mention it, these radian panels have a fun feature where you can swap them out for various length levers or colors. Now to take a closer look at the bolt itself, we'll just fold the stock slightly. Well, actually you can fold it all the way. You can see it locks out the bolt knob there, but just have it slightly open, run this back. And then there's where your little bolt lever is right there. You press that and your bolt slips right out. Now the bolt itself is where the magic happens. This thing is incredibly complex inside, whereas the gun itself is actually just really simple. Really dialed down for efficiencies, but uh, internally a very simple system. Really quickly here, you can see that trigger in there. Here's the weighted mass in the front of the trigger that balances it out. And here's the little bar that just comes up and touches the sear. That's really all you're doing with the trigger. And that's why this thing can be so precise. Now from your bolt, it's kind of cool. You can actually fire this assembly without, without anything else. So your sear is actually right up in there. And if I press that, it drops the striker. And then this shiny bit right here is actually your caulking ring. So that's what controls it. So you can just rotate your assembly and that's recocked it. So you can see again here, the firing pin is retracted, but then as I push down here, boom, you drop it. And there you can see the firing pin now protruding. So this is a four lug system. These are your feed lugs here to feed off of an SR25 mag, your claw extractor, and your little ejector right there, plunger ejector. Your bolt sits inside your bolt shroud, and that sits inside this caulking ring, and your striker assembly is in there as well. If you guys wanna see this thing all torn apart, I have a separate video that goes into a lot of depth on that. But overall, this is just a beautiful, beautiful system. And it's very simple as an end user to replace your bolt knob as you wish. Again, I go into detail with that on the other video, so don't need to go into too much here, but it is very easy to do yourself. One other really significant aspect of the bolt in the queue is how it relates to extraction. In particular, the pre-extraction of potentially stuck cases. So in a Remington 700 action, that's all built into the motion of raising the bolt or caulking the action. So right there in that manipulation, you'd begin extracting the case and the bolt lever would give you the leverage to do that in the event that it was stuck. Now, in the case of the Remington 700 and most other traditional actions, the bearing surfaces involved of cranking this thing up are in hardened steel. And in some cases, again, the way to get a stuck case out of a Remington 700 are literally to beat up the charging handle. But the Q is an aluminum receiver, so they didn't want to do that. Instead, what they did, which I think is incredibly clever, is they built it into the rearward travel of the bolt. It's this right here. That action of pulling back the bolt knob, as you can see, is actively moving back the bolt and efficiently providing pre-extraction to any cartridge case, stuck or not. And again, while this does make use of a 45 degree bolt throw and uh, you know, you've got you know, heavier bolt lift as a result, you're not also working through pre-extraction. They've eliminated that. So it's, again, the actual bolt lift on this thing is really mild. The bolt also runs on these rails back here, which do a couple of things. They help it so that when you, uh, you, know, you put pressure on the handle when feeding forward, it's less likely to, to bind up and it also controls feeding really smoothly right into the chamber. Now, another pretty wildly cool part about the fix is its stock hinge mechanism. So the stock itself is skeletonized. There's a ton of adjustability in it, which is really nice. Your comb height is fully adjustable by means of a little pinch clamp in there, and your length of pull is the same. However, these bars are threaded, so you can clamp down with these little nuts. That's because this part experiences recoil, and the nuts then guarantee that your length of pull adjustment does not move. Now I have their big butt pad installed on here, which is uh, really nice. You got a lot of extra cushion in there. It's also adjustable by quite a wide range. And honestly, from the factory butt pad over there, which you can see is a very narrow profile relative to this one. If you're gonna be running it in 308, this is gonna be your friend. Undoubtedly, the most significant aspect of the stock itself is the hinge. Q went to great lengths to design the system. Listening to one of Q's podcasts, I forget now if it was either like nine weeks or nine months that one of their lead engineers spent designing this hinge mechanism. It was a wild amount of time. But what they came up with was this wedge lock system. It's got three points of contact. There's your wedge in there, your wedge in there, spring pressure, and then this pad back here, which maintains inline contact. And just the more you use it, the more it wears, it's just gonna wear tighter, which is pretty fantastic and actually pretty significant if you want to do any kind of precision work with this gun, you can't have a wobbly stock. For the grip, they chose the Magpul M08K grip just because it is super lightweight 
As long as you guys are willing to forego a beaver tail, you can swap out basically anything else you want that's fit standard AR firearms. Then moving ahead, the handguard makes use of this special Q-cert system, which now that I've done my homework on it, I prefer to M-lock. It's lighter and it's considerably stronger with each of these little steel inserts being able to hold like 800 pounds of force. It's also nice wide spacing, you get better cooling. And again, this is a very rigid rail. Like this is a full size rail on a 16 inch barrel and there is barely any flex on there, even at the end of it. And that's also with only the short rail installed, it ships with a long pick rail that runs all the way down here. All these connections are screwed down and that does add some more rigidity. If you're running things like lambs or lasers or have other inline thermal or night vision, you need, you know, you need to make sure things stay zeroed. As I mentioned, I'm just running my Alcan, so I like this all nice and free and clear. It's just great for the grip, keeps it lightweight and uh, looking pretty dead sexy if I do say so myself. I maintained a little q rail on here for use with a bipod. And I believe Q is also coming out with more direct attachment accessories for the q system. They have like sling mounts and there's a direct attachment for the Atlas bipod system. Unfortunately, not for the AccuTac system, which I definitely love, but uh, maybe in the future. The Q features a quick change barrel system, which is also really nice. And the way they do it is really clever as well. And the handguard has two screws. One is a pinch, which takes all the play out of the handguard here. So you get a nice, super solid fit. So undo that one and then pull this one out, which is what actually draws the handguard into the receiver. With that you can pull off your handguard. And then again, there's just another pinch which pulls out any play between the barrel extension and the receiver and then the barrel nut itself. And due to the effectiveness of the pinch on the barrel, you don't need a ton of pressure on the barrel nut. So that actually the whole system is user changeable out in the field by way of this very handy tool that uh, you can get right from Q. Across the board for all disassembly, all you need is a Torx 25, which is really handy. One tool to disassemble the entire gun is definitely a bonus. Now the barrel, while I have not tested out the accuracy personally, I've had plenty of accounts from people that I trust that say if it's a sub MOA and even sub half MOA capable rifle. And honestly, I don't have any reason to doubt it. Now up front, we have a tapered shoulder. That's fantastic for any muzzle device you're running that's built to accept tapered threads. Also backwards compatible for 90 degree shoulder things, but tapers are gonna give you concentric alignment as well as the tapers just naturally lock muzzle devices to the barrel. So you don't have to like rock set everything you put on here. Now the fix ships with a cherry bomb which is Q's universal muzzle device and is a fantastic suppressor host. It's just that it has a bit of stout recoil. So I like running something like there's a bottle rocket to help tame what is, uh, as mentioned before, pretty spicy recoil on such a lightweight 308 rig. There's also the blast deflector, which is the whistle tip. Also a very fun device and has its uses. I talk about that more in my shooting video. And guys, across the board, it's just a very smart, well-designed, well-thought-out rifle. So let's, uh, let's get into those uh, three negative little bits. Alrighty guys, these three issues, or at least perceived issues. So first things first, yes, there is some stout recoil on the 16 inch 308 gun as it stands out of the box. Give yourself that big butt pad, that helps a ton, a lot more surface area. There's also quite a bit of compression in here in this padding. And that gives the point of contact with your body a lot more displacement and disperses that recoil really nicely. And then if you actually wanna cut the recoil itself, add on the bottle rocket, that muzzle device acts as a break and really does cut the actual recoil that's then felt. With those things installed, honestly, I don't find this thing a problem at all. I took this gun out on two separate occasions and ran 75 to 100 rounds through each time. The first time was just out of the box and I did have some bruising on my shoulder the next day. The second time, which a lot of that was done on camera, I had no problems. It was a pleasant rifle to shoot and I had no subsequent bruising. Now for this crazy heavy bolt lift, I don't know guys. <clears throat> Striker assembly's down, so we've got to uh, cock the whole thing. I don't know, that wasn't, uh, that doesn't feel very hard. Very, very simple. Now keep in mind, I've got the big bolt knob on here, so we're getting a little bit more leverage, but I didn't really have any problems with the factory bolt knob either. What I did was get my thumb up here, right kind of by this live, free, or die logo from New Hampshire, where Q's based. Get my thumb right on there, get my fingers under here, and just crank up, and then run the bolt. That is very easy. And I will also say that, you know, after running about a hundred rounds, I did find that this whole action really did break in. I can see a couple little small wear marks in the camming system. So I can just see that, you know, the parts are just starting to wear together and smoothing out. And that's gonna to contribute to a slicker action with uh, less force required all the way around. So if the bolt lift is really bugging you. I mean, just practice it. You can get the bigger bolt knob to get more leverage. But honestly, what I do with the big bolt knob is I just, I hold on to that myself, lift up, run the gun, and if I'm trying to run really fast, 
kind of like a Lee Enfield doing the Mad Minute, you know. Trigger slapping aside, when you're trying to run fast, it is pretty effective. Cycling the fix action is just an incredibly ASMR rich activity. I would highly recommend it as a uh, method of de-stressing or just, uh, just enjoying your gun. No worries on dry firing. Q's got a gun as of several years ago that had been dry fired 120,000 times, did not break the firing pin. So uh, again, cycle to your heart's content. I know I do. And then we have the price point. Guys, at this moment in time, it's probably a moot point because Q can't keep these things in stock and they are continually back ordered. So that's even after their last price increase. Now the market is uncommonly hot right now and a lot of inventory is just clearing simply for existing, but Q basically hasn't had these things in stock for the last four years as far as, as I understand it. So until demand backs off, which it's hard to say because they're only just starting to explore international sales now, I do know that they're big on ramping up production so that they can actually fulfill more of these things and produce more of them. But at any rate, that's only one pricing strategy. You could also argue that, you know, the, the materials don't justify the cost. I mean, sure, this is a block of steel and aluminum and a few other fancy metals, but there is a lot of manufacturing time that goes into one of these things. And more importantly than that is the specialty labor that went into designing and engineering these things. Now, Q has an uncommonly large engineering team for its size and they don't just disappear when a project's done. I've seen throughout the number of videos that I've watched over the last few years that the fix has been out, and I've picked up lots of little design changes that are still, you know, rolling forward. Be it the caulking ring, the little bolt release lever here, other little tweaks and things that were just adjusted. The fix rifle is under continuous improvement and Q continues to pump out more really creative designs that aren't just slapped together. They are really well thought out. And that is a Jeep. Again, case in point, the example of the hinge mechanism that one of their lead engineers sunk a ton of time into, but that's a huge aspect of the fixed rifle. So as an end consumer, you have to think that you are paying for the, the time, effort, ingenuity, and engineering that went into a product like the fix. There is also a crazy high level of quality manufacturing, quality control, fit and finish. So that's all there as well. And as a quick anecdote, I don't recall Q ever issuing a recall. Alrighty guys, philosophy of use and final thoughts. The fix by Q is best described as a utility rifle, in my opinion. I think back to what was considered the most practical firearm um, by and large for a long period of time, which is basically the Ranger or the Scout rifle, which was basically a shorter barrel 308 rifle with a detachable box magazine that had about 10 rounds in it. Just a light handy rifle for use out in the bush. Now you look at the fix and that's just a better gun in every respect. Detachable box magazines that are of basically the, the, the universal type for 308 being the SR25 pattern, a folding stock so it can easily be slung across your chest in a nice compact package that is readily deployed, modular and user customizable handguard, as well as a quick change barrel system so you can run different calibers, incredibly nice trigger, modern AR ergonomics, and suppressor or other muzzle device ready. Plus in addition to the folding stock, it's also fully adjustable to user preference. And it does all of that while basically maintaining the same weight. I have a cool rifle over here from a long time ago, which was basically the standard status quo, um, this or say the Remington 700. This is a little Spanish FR8 built on a Mauser 98 action. And uh, that is a Q cherry bomb up front. Though it's actually not correct. I have it like on my like one thread because it's not actually the correct thread pitch, but I was going just for the look. But this thing is just really cool. We got a little trench mag on there. So I'm kind of trying to, you know, <laughs> kind of trying to bridge the gap here, but uh, you know, there's a lot left to be desired in the trigger as well between what was and what now is. So again, utility rifle, ranger rifle, just very practical backcountry, you know, bush. It's, it's light enough to be carried as a hunting rifle, full featured in terms of a modern tactical rifle. Now, I also think this would be an ideal rifle for a PRS match. I mean, I don't have a lot of experience there, so maybe I'm speaking from off base. I've had a couple of guys comment that they thought the recoil would be too stiff for that, but honestly, it's a light handy gun, very maneuverable, very quick to run the bolt. And as I've demonstrated and stated, the recoil is very manageable. Also, you can just run it in 6.5 and then have way less recoil to worry about in the first place. But I don't think that it necessarily excels as a bench gun. As it stands, there's no provision for a rear monopod. And while I'm sure Q could easily, or any other aftermarket company could easily design weights 
to attach to the Q cert, you know, give the give the gun some more mass and, and maybe perform better on a bench. I don't know that that's really the design intent. It's meant to be an everyman's everyday rifle, and it can work in essentially any application. But at the end of the day, kind of like the Honey Badger, it's it does what it does incredibly well. And I don't think you can fault it just because you can't force it into some niche application that you feel entitled that it should do. I covered a lot of similar aspects in my kind of do all everyday AR-15 build in which I use the constraints of sticking with a rifle build, not an SBR or pistol, and just setting it up to be very efficient and basically as practical as possible. And perhaps that's the best way of describing the fix. It's practical and quite possibly one of the best modern hunting rifles. The owner Kevin has taken his all around North America and all across South Africa, taking some serious game with his personal fix rifle. And if I could only ever have one bolt gun, it would be this or the mini fix. Actually, I'm lying. It would be the mini fix, which is the little baby brother to this thing chambered in 300 blackout. You can also do your 224 Valkyrie or very soon 223 and I can't wait for it. Anyways, guys, that's the spiel. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you guys like the fix or Q products in general and want to learn more about them, definitely check out the Live Q or Die podcast. Kevin hosts it. And uh, for, all, for all the guys out there in the industry that think Kevin's a dick um, from something you've heard or someone that's told you that, well, you I mean, you're kind of half right, but uh, you definitely get to see another full side of him. And I think you can appreciate a lot of the backstories in history if you check out the podcast. Highly recommend it. I listen to just about every one. They drop every Friday, and uh, who knows, maybe sometime in the future, I'll be a guest. Guys, with that, thanks a ton. I'll see you in the next one. Armin Gunn, out.